In this brief introduction, I'm going to talk a little bit about GIMP and also provide some information regarding what is its differences between itself and multi or in Photoshop. Both programs are very good choices. They just have different strengths as far as what they can do as far as graphical editing and also photographical cleanup and finally integration with videography. So let's go ahead and get started here a little bit. So mainly here, I'm going to talk about what is GIMP, comparing it to Photoshop, and just going briefly over how do you get started using GIMP. And finally, probably one of the most important things whenever you are working with any form of multimedia software platform is your file organization practices. So to begin, um, GIMP stands for GNU Image Manipulation Program. This is what we'll often call either open source or free to use software, which means you don't have to pay anything. This often, you know, a lot of times I'll tell this to students and, you know, they'll be like, oh, you know, it must be, you know, a lesser version of Photoshop. Anymore in this day and age, that's not exactly the case. Sure, when you're working with open source software, it's often uh, members of the community and members of the multimedia culture that are giving up free time to actually build and update the software. So there is that element to it. However, so much work has already gone into programs like GIMP that it is an excellent choice. For the things such as web development, for example, in web design, Yes, you can use Photoshop, but honestly, for a lot of the things that you need as far as branding, coloring, graphics on the web, but even photo editing, GIMP has that built in. So to buy the Adobe software and then have to buy the entire creative suite, which we'll get into later, versus just downloading GIMP, which is much more lightweight and doesn't take up as much space, it begins to kind of make you think about, okay, so which one, maybe I should just use GIMP. So Again, GIMP has many uses. You can do image manipulation just like you can in Photoshop. You can create images just like you can in Photoshop. And also you can edit images just like you can in Photoshop. So more specifically, what are some of the core differences here? Normally for web design, multimedia design, there's normally three things we kind of look at for our software is cost, plugins, and we normally rely on documentation. So again, GIMP completely free. Um, and it does update uh, not yearly, I would say not yearly like Photoshop. Often what you'll see with GIMP for, with its updates is they're making just smaller changes faster. Now, Adobe on the other hand, you pretty much get the huge updates or the new version once a year. And for students, you actually can start out, if you've never used the Adobe Creative Suite before, you can pay $20 a month for one year. I emphasize this because actually after the one year, it goes up to the standard cost of Adobe Photoshop, which is about $40 a month. So, and also to Adobe age old, they're very helpful. They just keep auto charging your credit card for you. So, uh, it's very easy to put the charge on and forget about it. Also with Adobe, as far as the cost goes though, you're paying that $20 a month. It's not just for Photoshop, it's for the entire creative suite, which means you get things like Premiere, you get things like Illustrator, you get Adobe Animate, you get uh, Adobe Photoshop, you can also gain access to a ton of other software packages that honestly, you may not need. So it's so then really zooming in on this specific discussion here, if I'm just looking to do photo editing and photo manipulation, I don't need the rest of the creative suite here. All I need is Adobe Photoshop. So now you need to think in terms of, okay, do I wanna pay either $20 a month for one year for Photoshop or $40 a month for Photoshop? Now, as you move on, and if you be, do continue as far as multimedia design and development, you will probably get to a point where yes, paying for instance, the $40 a month for the entire creative suite will be worth it. However, if you're starting out and this is your first time doing graphical editing and you're like, oh, I'm not really sure if this is my cup of tea, GIMP is probably the better choice. There is also a belief too amongst multimedia designers and developers that 
to be perfectly honest, you learn GIMP, you can really fumble your way through Photoshop and vice versa. Uh, both of the software packages share many similarities as far as layout and controls and items that are available to the designer in the software. Another thing that we often do as far as our packages and software is concerned is the use of plugins. We'll get into plugins later on as far as the course is concerned, but a plugin is the process of adding in additional controls and additional items that can make the software more robust. Once again, uh, Adobe Photoshop, we'll start with that one. That's a pretty easy one because Adobe Photoshop uh, you know, is owned by Adobe. They actually have a specific site where you can just go and download plugins to attach onto the software. GIMP, on the other hand, we do have to do a little bit of searching, but they are out there. A lot of the plugins for GIMP are items that are to give us controls that Adobe Photoshop has, such as photo, some photo correction capabilities, uh, also as far as some additional effects as far as graphics go. So the plugins do kind of play an important role. Lastly, something that kind of they're both the same, and honestly, this is a common practice across media software. We reference documentation as far as different elements. The documentation is online for both of them. And for example, as we continue through working with GIMP here, that's going to be your major reference there is the documentation. That is one thing as a multimedia designer slash developer, uh, you need to get very comfortable with sifting through documentation. So why don't we go ahead here, let's start talking a little bit about GIMP itself. So we've talked about, we've compared Photoshop, we're gonna put Photoshop on the shelf for this class, strictly focusing on GIMP and getting you up to speed and thinking about what you can do with GIMP. So first off, um, one of the big things whenever you're working with a photo editing software package is thinking about the file extensions that you can work with. Um, overall, uh, GIMP mainly focuses on image file types. So for instance, it will recognize things like the GIF, the ping, the JPEGs, uh, depending on which way it's spelt. And these are also too, uh, for this course specifically, you wanna get really comfortable with these because these are also standard web-based published file types. Now, before I talk about the working file type, I do wanna point out that there is a working file type for Photoshop, which is the .psd. One of the questions I often get is, well, can GIMP open a native Photoshop document? The answer is yes, sort of. Text elements, certain type of effects and filters may not carry over, but GIMP is capable of opening it. It may just not look like what it looked like in Photoshop, and you may have to backtrack a little bit and make some changes there. GIMP, on the other hand, its working file type is the .xcf. This means a working file type is where, let's say that you have a lot of edits done to an image or a graphic, and you save it as a working file type, so you have access to your layers, etc. This allows you to reopen the file and make edits. So if maybe you misspelled something and you noticed it on the published file, you can come back to this working file and you can go in and fix your spelling error and then republish it. Above all, one habit you wanna get into when you are working in this type of software and really any type of multimedia software you want to save the working files. You need to always have access to those because you may run into a situation where you are going to need this file to make edits or changes based on a client's requests. The only other thing I wanted to talk about, especially for if anybody, this is your first time working in a graphical program, there are two types of graphic types that we deal with in multimedia mainly. The first type is what we call the raster graphic, and that's something that GIMP shines at. Raster graphics are really these high quality graphics. Oftentimes these come off of uh, cameras. These also use pixels. Raster graphics are capable of housing thousands upon thousands of colors. The drawback is, however, we lose a lot of scalability as far as the image is concerned. We are tied to the amount of pixels as far as the PPI or pixel per inch 
of the graphic. If you've ever tried to zoom in and maybe upload something to your Facebook or your Instagram and it looks all kind of pixely or, you know, uh, blocky, that's an example of a raster graphic that has been over zoomed in on. So what GIMP or, you know, whatever graphic program you're doing, what it's trying to do is fill in the blanks. It's trying to sit there and look at the pixels around the area and say, okay, I think this is the color that would go there. So raster graphics are great as far as we use these quite frequently in print design. Uh, we also use them whenever we're working in photography because we want those thousands upon thousands of colors. Just so you're aware though, there is another type of graphic out there that you may find yourself working with and that's the vector graphic. Vectors excel at scalability. You can scale a graphic to fit on a billboard or fit on a postage stamp and you are not going to lose any quality of the graphic. The reason is, is it doesn't use pixels. Instead, with vector graphics, they rely on using mathematical equations. Uh, you want to get technical, it's like Bezier planes uh, behind the scenes so that it makes the lines and the curves and the points whenever it finishes designing those out, there is no use of pixels there in the sense that we understand as a raster graphic. Now, having said that, you can import vector graphics into a software package like GIMP. However, we do have specific vector graphics software. That includes the free version of Adobe Illustrator Inkscape or Illustrator itself. So at this point, if you wanted to take a moment, I encourage you go and download GIMP. Uh, again, it's very lightweight. It is multi-platform as far as Mac, PC, etc. So it is something that you can work with and get up and running. So with that, again, GIMP is a great software package for getting started. If you're not really sure, you know, or maybe you're trying this out, but also too, it's a nice way that should you go out and start freelancing, Instead of having to worry about paying for Photoshop, you can utilize and have a free to use piece of software that is just as capable. Now, whenever you're working with these type of projects though, one thing that I really wanted to also tie in just very, very briefly here, as far as the overall project is concerned, or as far as the discussion is concerned here, is thinking in terms of your file organization. So as I pointed out in the previous slide here, you are going to have some type of working file. But also you may have different types of assets that you're using. This can include, you know, just standard images. This could also be vector graphics, etc. One thing I would encourage you to do for each of your projects is have some sort of main project folder. Now, from a course standpoint, often my students will have maybe like the course name up here. And then within here, you're gonna have little folders that are for each of your individual projects here. But either way, within these folders, you wanna make sure that you have that XCF file, that working file. And then again, any type of assets such as graphics, vector images, et cetera, that you may want to work with. Now, in future videos, I am gonna also talk about because you may be pulling images and vector graphics off the internet, we are gonna also be focusing on things, especially such as copyright. Uh, you can get in a lot of trouble as far as intellectual property and copyright is concerned. So we'll be talking about those in a future video.